Next on call, fighting viral diseases. The virus embeds itself into the nerve root. And avoiding infection. Funding for this program is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System and Fishback Financial Corporation. There's the, the bell. Oh, the And which was healthier, the yogurt and the bagel? All right, I'm going to start by measuring the size of the You could also add grilled chicken to this recipe. Blow hard, blow, 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 keep pushing. Pull red handle to open bag. Hello and welcome to On Call. I'm Tammy Watson. It seems to be that time of year. Colds start going around and we all start worrying about stomach viruses and flu bugs. And this is our topic tonight. We'll quiz the doctors about treating bacterial and viral infections, talk about pneumonia, antibiotic resistance, and open the phone lines to take your questions about colds, viruses, and other bugs. With me in the studio tonight are Dr. Matt Bean, Dr. Brian Hurley, and our medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. You can call in with your questions about our topic right now. Our phone number is 1-888-DOCTOR-ON-CALL. Again, that's 1-888-DOCTOR-ON-CALL. 376-6225. And helping answer the phones tonight are volunteers from the South Dakota State University Pre-Professional Science Club and the SDSU Nursing Student Association. Dr. Holm, before you introduce our guests, I got a simple question for you. Why don't we have a cure for the common cold? Are viral illnesses that complicated? They are. I mean, it's like AIDS. It's like uh, shingles. Viruses I mean, are viruses just... are, uh, and you know what? The common cold is not one little target, it's huge numbers of viruses and the trick about viruses is they change, okay. they're moving around. That's why we haven't got an AIDS vaccine. If we had a, we have a influ, an influenza which is a viral cold, only is a, a severe one, that is this is the worst one and we've named it and we've located it and of course we're still moving and we do three of them and we hope we hit them. And we get a new one each year. And each year we change our, because the target is moving. All so right. that's the trick about the common cold. There's going to be more to talk about today. Oh, this is a great topic and we really do need your questions. We're not sure where you're coming from on this and everybody gets this darn stuff. And this is the time in the season, this is as timely as we can be and we've got a great set of guests for you this evening. Dr. Matt Bean from Avera Brookings Medical Clinic, a doctor, and Dr. Brian Hurley from the Avera Pulmonary Associates in Sioux Falls. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Good so good. we're going to start with you now, Matt. You, what is your specialty? You are a... I'm a combined internal medicine physician and pediatrician, so I see adults and kids. So you're an adult, pediatric, in, uh, outpatient, and hospital internist pediatrician. Kind of see them all, I guess. See, you're, you've got the whole, <laughs> and you teach. Half the time you're teaching at the School of Medicine. That's correct. And, uh, and what uh, is your experience as far as uh, dealing with respiratory infection? How much of what you see is pulmonary or respiratory? Or Well, I think like you, I mean, we're seeing this every day. It, it can be summer or winter. It's certainly more prevalent this time of year, but it's one of the very most common things that primary care physicians are seeing. Right. And Brian, you know, you're the past governor of the American College of Physicians for South Dakota. You are uh, a pulmonary internist. Uh, you're the first one that came to South Dakota? Are you the first pulmonary? No, no, Perry was. Dr. Perry was. Dr. Perry, dean of the med school. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you've got a terrible cold right now. I do. I, I, I came here to get an antibiotic. <laughs> you did? I asked, and I asked him, and he wouldn't, so I'm going to ask you. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, I need an antibody. Yeah, and do you remember the person you were examining when you came down when you got exposed to this? <laughs> well, it's one many, I think. <laughs> you but you've yeah. examined a bunch of people who have this every year. But you take care of a, a pulmonary, you know, the lungs in general. Uh, how much of what you do is respiratory infection? of one kind or another. We see a fair amount. We don't see, uh, as Matt said, he sees a lot of acute problems and we probably see more of the chronic illnesses. We see more of the um, chronic uh, uh, COPD patients, chronic bronchitis, we see a lot of asthma. And all of those patients can develop an acute problem as well that we yeah. see. A lot of times the um, patient though with uh, acute cold or acute bronchitis will go to their family physician, their internist first. But uh, we do take care of a lot of them. We do a lot of calls about them as well. And when they get <clears throat> really sick and they get hospitalized, you're also uh, right on the uh, cutting edge yes, you with that. To, uh, yes. You bet. Yeah. Well, we need your questions. We've got yeah. the experts. We'll talk about it right after this. In the United States, colds account for more visits to the doctor than any other condition. An issue that's probably going to come up more than once tonight is antibiotic resistance. It's what happens when bacteria learn to adapt and are no longer killed by antibiotics. If you have a serious bacterial infection that antibiotics won't take care of, you and your doctor may have your work cut out for you. One of the better known types of resistant bacteria is MRSA. Some call it MRSA and that stands for Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Staph is a common kind of bacteria that often lives on the skin of healthy individuals, but take an antibiotic resistant version of Staphylococcus aureus and add in a cut or a sore where it can enter into the body and serious health problems can follow. On call talk to a clinical pharmacist who specializes in internal medicine and infectious diseases to learn about new guidelines for treating MRSA. Brad Lively is an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacy Practice at South Dakota State University. One of his areas of expertise is infectious disease, and he has this to say about the battle against MRSA, a strain of antibiotic-resistant bacteria that can cause serious health problems. In terms of is MRSA winning, you know, in, the, in that specific instance, MRSA in general, uh, we are seeing a big increase, but we also have a number of antibiotic options that can be used to treat that, both uh, relatively inexpensive oral medications to some relatively high expense um, intravenous antimicrobials. So from that standpoint, I would say it's somewhat of a stalemate. MRSA infections can start out as small sores on the skin, like pimples, and these sores can quickly evolve into deep and painful wounds. MRSA can also spread into the rest of the body and cause a life-threatening infection that can affect the bloodstream and internal organs. The MRSA problem has really been growing over the last decade or so. Um, if you think about in the past, in the 80s, early 90s, maybe even somewhat the late 90s, MRSA was primarily an infection that we found in hospitalized patients or those that were at nursing homes, other long-term care facilities. It's really not the case anymore. We're starting to see it more commonly in patients out in the community that are otherwise healthy, don't have chronic disease states, really wouldn't have had any of the classic risk factors that we think of for MRSA infections. Lively says that the Infectious Disease Society of America recently released guidelines for the treatment of MRSA, in part because more and more data about MRSA is becoming available. These guidelines essentially go through, and it's actually the first thing that they address in the guidelines, um, is identifying that patient that likely has an MRSA infection as opposed to an infection of the skin that's caused by an, uh, another bacteria, and then they give some recommendations as to the most appropriate treatments according to their best evidence. Doctors, the story we just saw refers to guidelines for physicians, and we didn't really get into those, but what should the general public understand about MRSA? What, you know, what do we need to know about it? You know, Brian, you take care of a lot of people with pneumonia that have MRSA. I mean, how do you deal with that? I mean, that's, what, what do we need to make sure that people know about that? Well, and we, back to your, uh, excuse me for my cold here, <laughs> back to your uh, uh, initial uh, um, statement there about antibiotic use and when do we use antibiotics and colds, I think having an awareness and expectations of what when to call a doctor and when you get a cold and what you might ask uh, how you're doing. You need to know uh, you're running a fever, how you're getting along, how, 
uh, is it changed and what are your health problems? Uh, so we don't overuse antibiotics. Uh, the, uh, I think uh, antibiotics are useful uh, to try to avoid overuse, so is, uh, is, a, is very helpful in trying to decrease the amount of MRSA we, we um, um, can encounter and try to cut down on it because we're seeing a lot of it in the hospital and it's really, uh, it's really um, so significant now. I, I've yeah. thought it's a consequence of Levaquin. Uh, yeah. Not to be negative about one particular, but when a broad, broad <laughs> spectrum, the fluoroquinolone group came, it was seem, it seemed that suddenly that it was used everywhere and then yeah. suddenly that was when the MRSA uh, came in. Now that's been my suspicion. Is that your... I don't know. It's, uh, I think, broad use of antibiotics, uh, too long on antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics are tremendous and we've got some good choices. And they're really indicated in a lot of, uh, a lot of areas, folks that uh, have uh, acute, acute uh, serious illnesses. And if it's just an acute bronchitis, if you just have cough and, and uh, a lot of sinuses, they won't help you. In fact, uh, uh, in the emergency room, they've looked at the number of resistant cases that they see in the emergency room. 19% are from overuse of antibiotics, uh, or antibiotic resistance type cases. But uh, if you've uh, someone that has a coexisting illness, let's say, heart failure, or chronic lung disease, or immunosuppressed patient. It's a little bit different. You want to call your doc right away if you do get a cold or infection. Yeah, Matt, any, any bounce on that? <clears throat> well, kind of taking off a little bit on what maybe the average person's going to see on the skin, I think the spiders are getting blamed for lots of things. People say, oh, I've got a spider bite. Well, that's what MRSA can actually start out as on the skin. Looks like a small little pimple, a little pink dot, and then gets very tender to touch. Those are the things you want to address right away. Get in, sometimes just a matter of draining it will clear it up. But probably the most important thing, and this will come up over and over, is the washing of hands. That's probably the best yes. way to keep it from spreading. Yeah, and I, I, you know, you cannot say it enough. Uh, not only do we, um, you know, need to have the antibiotics work when we need them, uh, we, when we are overusing them, we get resistance, and then you have the MRSA. It is a result of overuse of antibiotics. We need to save them for tough times when people are sick or they're immunocompromised and they're hospitalized, that kind of a scenario. There's times to use them as an outpatient, but not nearly as much as I think we've been doing. Would you both agree with that, Stu? I do. Okay. I think there's, some, there's a group of patients, I think, if you have uh, congestive heart failure, if you have type 1, type 2 diabetes, if you've been in the hospital within the last year, uh, or if you're immunosuppressed, I think there's the four guidelines that uh, the American uh, College of Physicians would advise that uh, you can use antibiotics for those situations, a little more than you would the average person who doesn't have those. Yeah. I, re I recently read an article that said that they had taken the standard protocols for people who were admitted to the hospital with ammonia, and the protocol was treat with three antibiotics, two for gram negatives, one for <coughs> MRSA, and they compared that to the people who had lesser, not as common, not as, uh, you know, probably less, less effective and not being as safe. And that latter group did better than the super safe, very aggressive three antibiotic coverage. Uh, and and from, they think it might be because of the, the fact that we are uh, having side effects from the drugs. And, I, you know, it just amazes me to think that maybe sometimes less is more, yeah. you know. Now, Good point. You said that study was <clears throat> on patients that had pneumonia? Yeah. Pneumonia, we want to talk about pneumonia tonight because it can be caused by a lot of different things yeah. and it can be real serious. To tell me, what do we yeah, need to Matt, know about define pneumonia? pneumonia. Well, pneumonia is an inflammation inside the lungs, in the, li in, in the small little air sacs deep in the lungs. And in most cases, at least in adults, it's probably a bacterial infection. And yet, a lot of the symptoms of bronchitis, which can be viral, or even just a bad cold, cross over with pneumonia. So typically, the pneumonia is that infection that's maybe lasting longer with a higher fever, more shortness of breath, maybe some chest discomfort associated with it. So think of the worst cold that's settled into your chest with a prolonged fever yeah. and shortness of breath. Yeah. Yeah. And that's pneumonia. Now, uh, they, there are a lot of people talk about upper respiratory infection. What is an upper respiratory infection versus a uh, lower respiratory? So think of upper respiratory as sort of anything from the neck up. Ear infections, sinus infections, common cold, sore throats, upper respiratory. Lower respiratory would be more the bronchitis, the pneumonias. For little kids, maybe RSV, things like that. What is RSV? 
respiratory syncytial virus. What? So a fancy, fancy <laughs> name for one of the viruses. Um, actually a very common virus. Probably all of us uh, get it at some point. And most kids, in fact, they predict somewhere between 60 and 80% of kids, all kids every year get RSV. And it's only a small percentage mm -hmm. that end up getting real sick with it and coming in. Is there a vaccine for that one? Is that a shot yeah. that kids no. need? No. Like you mentioned at the beginning, unfortunately, a lot of the yeah. viruses we don't have vaccines for. And that's yeah. one that there's a few different serotypes. And, and that's why we can tend to get it over and over again. So it's a, it, but it's a mean, um, uh, can, can be a mean motor scooter. I would say it. For uh, the little kids. You know, I think it's kid. really the little kids, maybe the immune suppressed that get sicker with it. Uh, for us, you know, the average it's person, cold. it's just a bad cold. Yeah. Well, how do you know when to go see a doctor? Because I, with pneumonia in adults, it seems like you, you think you're coping, and then it, there's a tipping point where, oh, man, I should have gone in. And with kids, it's a, how are parents supposed to know what, when do you go in? Well, I, I'd, I'd echo what uh, he was saying, that uh, typically, People have a fever with a viral infection, and a, they have a fever, and they have a cough, and they have ache all over, and then they have uh, uh, this cough and nasal chronic stuff. And the fever goes away in the first two, three days, and then that cough persists for two weeks, typically, okay? So, or one week anyway. But what happens is when that fever comes back and that cough is continuing or worsening, then you shouldn't dally. It's that return of the fever, to, uh, you know, or a persistent fever. I would agree. I think when you come in and it's the third day of any illness, it's really unlikely to be a major bacterial infection. Almost always a pneumonia has been preceded by a, a viral infection or a cold or something that's sort of kept you from clearing out those secretions. Same with sinus infection. Oftentimes there's a preceding set of maybe a week's worth of symptoms, and then you get, start to get sicker. Those are the ones you'd worry about. You're not cleaning your lungs. So how about cough suppressant then? I mean, the codeines and the phenergans with codeines, I mean, there's some data to suggest that if you suppress the cold cough, then you don't clean out the lungs and you get pneumonia oh. sooner. Is that true? Well, I'd like to hear yeah, Dr. Brian. Hurley's yeah. opinion on that. But I, I would say, yeah. you know, some of the cough suppressants are actually expectorants. They'll thin the secretions. And there's maybe some benefit to things like guaifenesin, which is in Robitussin, of thinning the secretions and getting it out. Um, as far as suppressing the cough, if it's not a very productive cough and you get something that seems to work for you, probably not too bad of an idea to try. Yeah, I don't think there, I think some studies have shown it really doesn't make any difference uh, in the outcome. You know, if you suppress the cough, it doesn't help that you get over it. Uh, if it's not too bad, it's, uh, it's uh, probably not worth taking. And they've looked at uh, decongestants. We were just talking here, the ones you had a little bit of luck with ahead of time, yeah. but uh, sometimes nasal decongestants are very helpful, the nasal steroids. Um, but in general, su the heavy suppressant cough medicines, uh, uh, unless it's really interrupting with a person's sleep and, and they're not sleeping and they're, they're having trouble along that way, maybe their chest is hurting, then it can be helpful. I, I'll, I'll use a little bit of that for people at night only, and I'll try to, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I think we underestimate the value of a cough drop, which is any, anything that you're sucking on and it makes saliva and then you swallow saliva, and it, it drains, actually, it's a, you know, it makes the sinuses uh, drain and when you blow your nose you push it in the wrong direction if you swallow it brings it the right direction so I push lots of cough drops and um, plenty of hot tea. Interestingly there's a study that came out recently looking at kids and cough suppressants and very few if any of them work and the one that came out on top was honey. Honey? Interesting. A spoonful of honey. Buckwheat honey specifically, but Buck honey. Honey. <laughs> <laughs> so do you put that in your hot drink, or you um, basically it's just warm honey on a spoonful given to children, and it worked just as well as the dextromethorphans and the different really? decongestants. Now, isn't there a danger in, in honey <coughs> carrying an infection? You have to be a little careful in kids under age one, um, and that's mm. the risk of botulism because of botulism spores that can be found in honey, and kids uh, kids under age one wouldn't tolerate that in their gut. Is that old honey or new honey or it doesn't uh, should, matter? It shouldn't matter, but it's probably a very low risk, but I wouldn't use it in kids under age one. I want you to know that when I was in a little kid growing up and we'd go visit my grandma Axie in Springfield, Missouri, she would give me with this terrible cold a, a teaspoon or a tablespoon of honey mixed with whiskey <laughs> and then she'd smear Vix vapor rub all over my chest, and I mean, every time I see the Vix or I smell it, I go, Grandma Axie, you are in the room. <laughs> have you, have, you know, are you, what do you think about Vix vapor rub? Right? Well, I don't use it myself, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, okay. it was an old remedy that uh, 
I'm, I don't have uh, any experience with that. No. Oh well, yeah, I was going to ask, is there value to that, or yeah. do you know? Mental in them. VIX has come out ahead of a few things, yeah. uh, but still probably a lot of placebo effect there. So <laughs> you go with the honey. How, how about putting that honey in some hot water and having a little honey tea? tea. I think warm liquids or hot liquids yeah. do a lot of good, yeah. Yeah. clearing the secretions. I was going to mention, there is one group of patients that uh, uh, the elderly sometimes present differently. So if you're caring for someone or have a parent or grandparent who's 75 or older, sometimes they don't have a fever and sometimes a cough is different. So if that lingers, they're, they're a group that uh, should encourage or help get in to see the physician because they may have indolent pneumonia that's yeah. there that uh, may not present as much yeah. as well as a younger I, person. I think the most common symptom of pneumonia is Something's wrong. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. He's not right. Something's wrong. I had a patient come to me, by the way, today, 70-ish, uh, had something's wrong feeling, you know? I mean, I did an EKG and I cardiac enzymes and I smelled a rat, you know? Everything. I mean, all his lab was okay. So, you know, I think he's just got the early crud. <laughs> <laughs> my, as my dad said, you know, Good he's got the crud. <laughs> Well, we've got some questions coming in if you're ready to right. dive in. Uh, lady, 78, year old, 78 years old from Rapid City. Uh, she has severe, she's had severe sinus problems lately. She has high blood pressure and diabetes. So medicine is limited. What do you rec recommend or what, what course of action? Let, let, let's talk about what do you have to have for sinus symptoms before an, we know that an antibiotic is reasonable. What do you use for, when do you uh, decide that you're going to treat a, a sinus infection with antibiotics? And what do you do for sinuses first? Um, <clears throat> usually treat them conservatively. I think you try to see how, how uh, difficult. Now this, this patient's had recurrent sinus infection, is it? Right? Yes, has had Especially. severe sinus problems lately. Lately, yeah. yeah. Probably may or may not have an x-ray. Sometimes they, they need to have a sinus films, maybe a CT of the sinuses uh, be evaluated. They could have polyps or some obstructive problem. Uh, um, if it uh, persists, uh, x-ray can be helpful, I think, to see if they have um, significant sinusitis. And then they often do need antibiotics, I think, for that. Uh, if it's a uh, person who didn't give their age, but I think that may be, uh, if, it is, if it is persistent and, and significant and discomfort and has a fester, if they have a fever, um, yeah. I would be I definitely helpful. agree if it's a chronic situation that sometimes imaging will start to play a part. But if you just take all comers in, even with bad colds, and start imaging them with sinus CTs, they get thickening in the mucosa, they're mm -hmm. full of fluid, it, it doesn't look normal. So yeah. certainly that isn't the first thing you would no. do. Now maybe in a recurrent case, it is helpful. But okay. I guess in, for me in particular, I tell patients, if it's getting worse, past seven to 10 days, lasting beyond a couple of weeks with severe facial pain, pressure, and fever. Yeah, yeah then it's probably reasonable. And pus. Uh, yeah. I think I heard that drainage. pus, pus drainage, not, not yellow mucus or yeah, green okay. mucus, it's pus music, uh, mucus, and that's, that's different. So I could tell the difference if it's drain, if it's pus. So, or so it's, it's pus, pus, it's a fever, it's facial pain, it's persistent longer than a week. Then I then I'll treat with an antibiotic. I mean, I kind of skip the, the skip the, the, just, the radiation. Just being anymore. miserable with facial pressure and pain and some drainage. I mean, that's that's just going to be a bad cold. And and uh, you know, it won't make a difference giving an antibiotic, except that it might give you diarrhea. It might give you an overgrowth resistant MRSA infection. I mean, you just want to you want to avoid these things unless you have to. And you stop them blowing their nose because it rams it into the sinuses. I, I've made that point. I don't think too many other people do, but I'm afraid of blowing the nose. Now, Dr. Reach would disagree with me on that. But. <laughs> okay, well, I, uh, we'll move on. I, I think you've talked around that answer, kind of given her some ideas there, that if it's been ongoing, see the doctor. If yeah. it's Okay. 72-year-old uh, caller from the fair city of DeSmet. A uh, lady is diabetic, has had a flu shot in September, and she's wondering if she should get another one or a booster one now, or is that further into the season? What do you think? Interesting question. I think two years ago I would have answered it, mm, boy, you're four months out from your last one, maybe it'd be a good idea. I think the newest recommendations are saying now, get your flu shot early, it's going to last you the whole season, don't worry about it. We're probably looking at nine plus months of effectiveness. Now, real, real high-risk patients, you may want to consider a booster after a few months, but I think for the average patient, a one-time and done. She's not that high. I mean, she's diabetic. She's in the 70s. Yep. That high-risk? Uh, personally, I'd be, I, I'd I would say, no. say she's probably covered. 
wash your hands, cover your cough, don't, okay. you know, Brian? I think so, and when it does hit the community, it, unfortunately we haven't had it, but uh, try to stay out of, uh, of the crowds uh, as best you can during those times. But let's say you want to go to church. Pardon? Church. I know you're a church-going guy. Mm -hmm. you got to pick the right service. <laughs> okay. Wonder there's not many people. Yeah. Is it, you're a religious man. If I choose not to shake hands with somebody to present goodwill, is that perfect? Just you know, this time of year? Smile say, and say, hey, bump elbows. You don't want to shake my hand. Nobody wants to shake that guy's hand if they say that. You know, bump <laughs> my elbow. You don't want to shake my hand. You don't have to explain <laughs> anything. That's good comeback. Um, we've got an interesting question from Belle Fouche. A lady is 45 years old. Her daughter-in-law had sinus surgery a year ago and has now been diagnosed with influenza A and B and pneumonia and a, fungu and a fungus in the spleen, lung, and bladder, but was given medication for a toe fungus. Ooh. How does that work? That's Ooh. the question. How does that So Well, Brian, what, what, how would you take this fungus thing? In, in the, the, the fungus was in what is it? The, lung? the fungus is in the spleen, lung, and bladder, um, but the medication was something for a toe fungus. How old is the child? Uh, doesn't say the name. Doesn't say the name of the daughter-in-law. The caller's name is identified as 45, but that might be the daughter-in-law as well. I do oh. not know. We don't know the age of the patient then. No. Okay. Um, Range between 20 and 45. Yeah, it's, it's hard to know uh, the specifics there. I think the uh, whenever you have uh, isolated fungus that, uh, in those areas, if it's uh, significant, you worry about um, a lot of issues, you know, uh, especially in the spleen and so on, the immunosuppression and oh, other yeah. things that uh, may be a serious problem, but I, I, uh, you'd have to know the whole situation there. And so, I don't know what the story is. It has already had anti uh, toe fungus, anti fungal medicines, and, and you know, therefore. Maybe Sometimes a toe, you can, it's a common place to get that, but the spleen and other issues are a little Very bit more good. concerning. The only thing I can think of is maybe they're thinking the patient is on Diflucan or Lamisil, yeah, which yeah. can be used exactly. for toe fungus, but is being used for a systemic fungal infection yeah, in this case, and there might be some confusion true. there. Yeah. I think there's more to the story. Yeah. Um, it's kind of tough to answer beyond that. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, we're going to go back to the videotape real quick. It's estimated that about one million cases of shingles occur every year in the United States. Shingles is a viral infection that causes a painful rash. A new study shows that receiving the shingles vaccine is associated with lowering the risk of getting the disease. Catherine Dolph has more in this week's JAMA report. Shingles is an itchy, blistering rash on the skin caused when the dormant chickenpox virus reactivates in the body, usually much later in life. It's so painful because the virus embeds itself into the nerve root. And then as the virus becomes more active again, it works its way to the surface of the skin and is, it's extremely painful. Dr. Juanita Watts has seen the effects of shingles in her practice. One of her patients, Jane Adrian, is hoping to bypass the disease by getting the shingles vaccine. She watched both her parents suffer from the pain shingles caused. Did they have a lot of pain that even went on after months? Yes, they after did. the rash was gone, right. the pain right. was still there. The uptake of the vaccine is low in this country. Dr. Hung Fu Seng from Kaiser Permanente and co-authors studied medical records of more than 300,000 adults 60 years and older enrolled in Kaiser's Southern California Health Plan from January 2007 through December 2009. Researchers compared the incidence of shingles between those who received the vaccine and those who did not. We found that vaccination against shingles is associated with a 50% lower risk of developing shingles in the elderly population. The study appears in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association. It's going to cause a little discomfort, some stinging. That's normal, okay? The vaccine is just a single shot and available to anyone 60 years and older. Well, I'm relieved. Hopefully it will keep me from getting the shingles outbreak. And um, I'm, just, I'm just glad I got it taken care of. Catherine Dolph, right. The JAMA Report. There are over one billion colds in the United States each year, with children averaging three to eight colds per year. 
Thank you for joining us tonight. We're talking about colds, viruses, and other bugs. And here in the studio, ready to answer your questions, are Dr. Matt Bean, Dr. Brian Hurley, and on-call medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. You can call in right now with your questions about our topic. Our phone number is 1-888-DOCTOR-ON-CALL. Again, that's 1-888-376-6225. Doctors, I got a question here. We can follow up talking about shingles and shingles vaccine. But I asked, I must ask Matt, the pediatric expert, three to eight colds a year. I mean, we just heard that. Three to eight, does every kid have three to eight colds a year? I think your daycare kids are on the eight spec side of the spectrum and maybe kids that are alone at home with their mother or father are probably on the three end of the spectrum, but <laughs> definitely six to eight is pretty common in daycare children. Each one of those lasting two to three weeks, you can see why parents think their <laughs> kids are constantly sick. Yeah, because they are. Yes. So the question is, any advantage of three to eight year colds, eight, eight colds a year? I mean, there's some data about uh, those kids being protected against uh, lymphomas and stuff, isn't there? Well, I can't quote that one. I know what, if you look at the studies on number of colds um, by age eight, kids that have been in daycare get the same number as kids that are just in school getting exposed. But the kids in daycare get them either. early and the kids that didn't go to daycare end up getting them as they get into kindergarten and first grade. So, so you, you get them eventually, right. no matter, you know. Well, I'm, I'm curious, would being in daycare be beneficial to a doctor who has to see all these people with colds? Yeah. How many colds do you gentlemen get a year? I suppose you're pretty conscientious about washing hands and that. I had a cold this year. I didn't have one last year. So you yeah. I mean, I, I don't have them very much. Do you guys? One a year, maybe. About that, yeah. yeah. So but again, happen, we're, I, know, but it's pretty rare. I think I can remember back to pediatric residency though, and all of us were getting sick yeah, constantly because yeah. we're getting coughed on, kids, and yeah. you know, you get inoculated directly into the eye. There's not much. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> remember this story? They did a study where they they know that everybody who goes to pediatric residency that first internship year, everybody gets sick, just sick, 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 the first three months, and then they stabilize out and you can't seem to protect them. So they did a study, there were three groups. One got mask, gown, gloves. The second group washed their hands, and the third group was, they just did what they did before. And they found what? The answer was, washing, hands. washing their hands did as well as masks, gloves, and gown. Isn't that amazing? And you throw some sleep deprivation in, and maybe right. not the best nutrition, or not exercising <laughs> like they used to, yeah, and right. it's, it's not a good mix. <laughs> no, no. Sick. Okay, well, like I said, I've got a question here, but did you want to talk any more about anything else you wanted to follow up? No, I think we're good. Okay, hit the question. Um, this is from Witten, South Dakota, a gentleman age 71. Uh, he sprained his lower arm five days ago. The arm is now green and swollen. What should he do? Ooh. He what now, say that? Sprained his lo lower arm five days ago. The arm is now green and swollen. What should he do? Well, it's, he bled into his arm, and the green is just the blood, uh, the bruise. You know, it's just the blood kind of being resolved. And it'll turn, you know, kind of a greenish yellow, and then it'll rusty. It'll get rusty and then go away. Yeah. Anything? I wouldn't be concerned, I guess, about an infection in that case unless uh -uh. it's starting to get hot. Yeah. He's getting fevers or something yeah. else with it. No, he, as long as the sensation's good, it's not getting numb on him. Uh, okay. He can still move it well and can blanch and it'll blanch and come back okay in his, when he presses on it. Okay. If he, if he wants to uh, ace wrap it and put some heat on it, it'll get rid of some of the edema and resolve Keep it. Keep it elevated. Keep it elevated. Okay. Get rid of some of that hematoma. All right. I wanted to ask you, gentlemen, about a strep throat. And uh, I think in common parlance, a lot of uh, any sore throat is strep throat, but strep throat is not any sore throat, correct? Strep throat is a, it's a is a particular strep, but there's some debate about whether we're really benefiting people with antibiotics or not. Matt, what do you think? Well, I guess the studies would look at it and say no. As far as symptom relief, you're maybe gaining a day of fewer symptoms by going on antibiotics, but mm -hmm. probably specifically <laughs> with strep throat now, the the the, the issue is the side effects long-term from a strep infection, and that's things like rheumatic fever or renal-related infections or inflammation and things like kidney, kidney problems. So it's really the side effects long-term from the strep infection, mm -hmm. not so much making their symptoms better. Because, and, 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 uh, and that is the misnomer people think, oh, my, my throat is so bad, I gotta have, a, have an antibiotic, it'll make me feel better, and the answer is maybe just a little. It about isn't. 24 hours, maybe. 
Yeah. So the real reason you're treating is to prevent rheumatic heart disease and, and uh, kidney disease. And, uh, but do we really? I mean, are we sure that that's happening? Yeah, you wondered. I think the strains have shifted, and it's it's probably a little bit debatable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did you want to follow up? Okay. Diving back to a question from Hot Springs. A 61-year-old female got the flu five days ago with a fever of 101 to 102. A rash occurred on neck and shoulder and has not gone away. The rash is hot and almost sore. Is this H1N1? What might she be de dealing with? Is she on an antibiotic is my first question. Does not say. Yeah. Brian? Well, it could be a number of things, I guess. It'd be uh, fever still there at, uh, um, if she had any respiratory symptoms that would, uh, uh, productive cough or, or phlegm that might suggest she has a pneumonia, usually with uh, just a regular uh, throat situation, uh, you wouldn't expect that. But if she has a temperature, why, that's one indication to, uh, to see her physician and maybe get, and probably get an x-ray to make sure it isn't there. It sounds a little more complicated with that rash. I'm not sure what that is. It sounds a little bit more uh, um, possibly a viral a type of illness, but uh, um, how old was? Uh, uh, lady 61. 61, yeah. And if fever persists or so, I think that's going on a little bit, I'd probably see your physician and yeah. have that evaluated. Okay. Matt? Influenza is not real common to cause a rash. It oh. certainly can happen, but um, you know, she talks about flu, but of course flu is, yeah. means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. and. Um, in this case, it certainly isn't a typical case of influenza. I, I think the first thing I always think about when I see a rash is antibiotic. Are you on an antibiotic? Mm -hmm. Is this an antibiotic-induced rash? Is the fever an antibiotic-induced fever? I mean, I, you, you know, I have people who they come, there's a strange fever going on. Their fever's not going away. Their, you know, their pneumonia should be getting better. What it, could it be? Ooh, it could be that antibiotic. I mean, oh. sure, common. How does that happen? Are they allergic, allergic. to the antibiotic? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. You, you know, and you don't have. I mean, uh, the first time a person gets an antibiotic, they don't have an allergy. It's the second time. Hmm. You know, you have to have a sensitizing period, and sometimes it's the eighth time. Okay, um, real quick, both uh, Dr. Bean and Dr. Hurley use the term productive cough. Is that, it's actually bringing up some gunk and I'm getting that out of my lungs? Yes. Is, that is that a good way? thing? Is that an indication for treatment? What do we do with a productive, productive cough? I think it, it depends if it's just part of the cold and cough and they're gradually getting better. Uh, that's a good situation. The one, the one area if a person has uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, COPD or chronic bronchitis, and this is a new on top of that cough. And there, that's an indication where I think we were a little more liberal in the antibiotics mm -hmm. to get after right yeah. away when somebody has an underlying problem. Okay. Uh, Matt, you can comment about that. I would agree. Yeah, I don't have any other Okay. A uh, question, Lady 61 from Mitchell. What pneumonias are contagious and what measures should be taken to prevent and treat pneumonia? There's more than one type of pneumonia. Yeah, let's so. talk about the kinds of, there's atypical, there's staph and strep, there's gram negative. I mean, explain the kinds. I'll give the, a quick short answer then. Yeah. I'll give it to Brian. <laughs> Basically, most of the pneumonias are not contagious. It's going to be the cold that maybe started the pneumonia is contagious. Okay. Could have been contagious. But once it's developed into a pneumonia, bacterial infection, just like with sinus infections and ear infections, you're not passing those to one another. Now, there are exceptions, but that's a general rule now. That's right, yeah. Yeah. And define the kinds of pneumonias. I mean, uh, and are there one kind that might, well, tuberculosis is a pneumonia. That's contagious. But what about the MRSA? How do you differentiate your pneumonias, Brent? Um, the, uh, um, I think you take a history and see you can get an organism, obviously, that tells you what it is. If you can get a bug and you can culture it, but uh, pneumonia certainly it's diagnosed by a chest X-ray that shows uh, the infiltrate, and it's usually uh, it can be viral or it can be bacterial, and then there's several kinds of bacterial. We look at kind of the severity if it's uh, community acquired or, or if it occurs in a hospital setting or if they're immunosuppressed. It makes a big difference in how one would approach it. Community acquired uh, pneumonia usually. You do treat those with antibiotics. They're either viral or atypical or bacterial. Atypical would be a mycoplasma. Uh, viral would be influenza in the season, and bacterial would be pneumococcal or one of those kinds. If they're immunosuppressed, but on steroids or have an underlying uh, malignancy, they're being treated. It's a little different story, and, and those folks need uh, really to be looked at uh, very aggressively initially. Broader spectrum antibiotics. Might be, or at least, at least uh, uh, really valuable. Try to get cultures, try to get an answer so you can limit the 
So I expect to be seen. There's soon. new data about being able to tell a kind of bacteria by a urine test. Have you looked at that? Have you heard that? It can be helpful, and uh, you can pick up uh, uh, for strep infection. Uh, for instance, a pneumonia comes in, you can do a urinary antigen for strep, or Legionella can be helpful. We do that a lot in the hospital. You can tell because they're excreting part parts of, of that. Part of that, you pick up the antigen. That the antigen. Yes, it is. Okay. We got three questions that just came in about shingles, and basically they're the same question. If you've already had shingles, do you get the shot? Matt? That's an interesting question. I, I think the, the, the answer is yes. Um, How long from the, from the shingles? You know, I mean, I've had that question too a million times, and I don't have a good answer. Yeah. The shingles itself, you would think, would boost your immune system a little bit, but the fact that you got shingles in the first place is telling you mm -hmm. it's maybe not boosted yeah. enough, and that's where I think it goes back to a, a big antigen load or a big yeah. Protein of that type of virus in your system to help you boost that immune system up so that you don't get it again. I, I have to say that the, the pharmaceutical representative is one source of information. It's not. It should not be your first, and it shouldn't be your only, and it shouldn't be your main source. But sometimes you can find out some things, and that was the very question that I asked the pharmaceutical representative about this particular a a answer. And his answer is, and I don't have this proven, but I'm admitting to everybody that I, this <laughs> is where I got it. And that is the study, they have a study that supported the idea of giving, giving uh, the uh, shot, even if the, the, uh, the, sh the shingles were rel relatively recent. Okay. And so I would say, I don't know, I don't have the answer either, but I think I probably would uh, go with it if your shingles is all resolved now, it's not been too long ago, uh, and you might be immunocompromised in particular. Okay, and if you've already had, if you had shingles once, can you get it again? Most certainly. Just, okay. So Not very commonly, but it definitely yes. can happen. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, a question from Rapid City. For someone who has a sore throat, what signs or symptoms indicate they should see a doctor and have a strep throat test Ooh, done? That's your territory. <laughs> Matt? Well, I think that almost all strep is going to have some fever with it. Um, so if you have a sore throat and sore throat only, and a fever, probably a good thing to get checked out. If you've got general symptoms, yeah. not. No, if, if you've, you've lost your voice, probably virus. not. Yeah. I'm sorry. Most, most of the uh, strep inflammation occurs in the back of the throat, not down at the level of the vocal cords. So if you're hoarse, less likely to be strep. If you've got a runny nose, mm -hmm. sneezing, mm -hmm. cough, less likely to be strep. You've got just a sore throat and fever, raises the, raises the concern. Okay. Ready for another MRSA question? A uh, lady from Sioux Falls, she's taking an ointment for MRSA, MRSA, called, help me with this, M-U-P-I-R-O-C-I-N, Muprosin? Muprosin. Muprosin. In the nose, morning and evening, will her body become resistant? So what are the, what's, why would you take Muprosin and what are the consequences of it? She's a carrier. Yeah. Have I you had experience with this? Our nose is actually at a nice temperature for Staphylococcus, and that's why it tends to harbor there. And if you rub your nose and touch things, that's how this gets spread around. So that's how it can sort of live in your body without causing problems, and yet you're the source of problems for others. So we think we might be able to decrease the frequency of how many of these infections occur if we try to clear it out of the nose. I think that's been less than successful as far as how well it works, but it's com something to do. The common treatment is twice a day in the nose for a week or two, and it should decrease the carriage rate of that bacteria in the nose. Is she at risk for, you know, having a bad complication with MRSA in her own body? Yeah. If, yeah. If, she, if she's taking it because she's a carrier? I, I don't think that uh, there's a major risk, for, uh, but it, we, like, the question, like Matt says, I don't think it's, uh, it's that proven. Brian, you have any? No, no. Okay. Yeah, What's the other uh, name for? Uh, Bactroban is the uh, brand name. See, it's been around for a long time, and it's an antibiotic ointment. And of course, there's always the concern that you might sensitize a person. They might develop an allergy to the Bactroban, although there's that's... There's a new one out now, Altabax, that's something similar to that, too. So there's other options, but uh, I think our... Initially, we thought, boy, this is the answer, and yeah. we found that it really... Within a few months, certainly, people are usually colonized again. Okay. Yeah. 
I, I was thinking about uh, what is it the infection that kids get and then and they have crusty golden on the face. Impetigo. So talk about impetigo and how you handle that and, and do you culture and if it's MRSA, what do you do? In most cases, I haven't seen a lot of resistance to that in particular. So I think the usual antibiotics still work. The simple, narrow spectrum that cephalexin. we can use, cephalexin, something like that. But I tend to treat kids with antibiotics with impetigo. Um, you could get by if it's one little spot treating it topically, with but boy, it can, it can spread all yes. over with pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty quick to use antibiotics, especially in little kids. Excellent. There are so many kinds of antibiotics, Why? and in my mind, I think, Penicillin. It isn't that way anymore. Do you guys have yeah. favorites or ones that people? Brian, should... do you, how, how do you? Yeah, how do you pick your <laughs> antibiotics? Well, you try to you try to be selective. You try not to use a broader antibiotics, and I think that's one of the reasons we have had a lot of resistance because antibiotics. Um, they've looked at studies of people that have had just treating acute bronchitis. That uh, some of the um, some of the um, choices uh, now uh, some years ago used to be more selective. Now it's shifted about. I think it's. 30, 40 percent more broader antibiotics, and that just leads to more resistance. So, sometimes back to your question, I think you try to be selective as to where they, what the problem is, and what the environment is, and is that patient immunocompromised? Were they in a hospital setting or not in a hospital setting? Are they young and healthy like Matt? Or are they, are they, are they got a uh, old like they, me? Old like you. <laughs> yes, I, I, you know, I was trying to work, look for the right word. Yeah. Right back there, but, uh, <laughs> Distinguish. I think it's distinguished. But I think you have to base it on, on that and what, what, uh, what their history has been and what kind of problems they have. Uh, if they're immunosuppressed, they have malignancy, you choose your antibiotic. I use a lot of amoxicillin, erythromycin, mm -hmm. uh, I guess I think that's good. A, a yeah. azithromycin, Bactrim. I mean, I use the old, old things when I can. not yes. You're okay with that? Oh, absolutely. Well, I've got a science question for you. Dumb it down for me. I take this pill. It goes into my stomach. It gets into my bloodstream and it does what to the infection in my fingernail? How does that work? How does it kill the ana kill the bacteria? Matt, I would say most cases, like in your scenario, it's that it actually breaks down the bacteria's wall. Okay. So the bacteria breaks open and spills its contents and can't reproduce and continue infecting you. But it's not going to affect my, the healthy human cells. It's going it, to. Right, I mean, specific to that bacteria. Now, in other cases, it's how the bacteria reproduces in certain proteins that it blocks, and there's all sorts of different mechanisms. And as soon as we figure out one, the bacteria starts figure using another. <laughs> <laughs> and most of it, it just sure. suppresses the bacteria, holds them down a little bit enough for the, your own body to kill. Yeah, you know, it's really you—you—you really you, you, you just hold the bacteria down with the, the antibiotic, and the. And the body does the work. Okay. Well, we've got to move into our little wrap-up segment. Dr. Bean, we'll give you 30 seconds to stand on a soapbox and tell us what we ought to know about this topic. Take home. Well, I think the take home comes back to simple things like washing hands. I think it comes back to trying to limit the use of antibiotics, making sure that you're not rushing in in the first couple, three days of a stuffy nose or a cough, giving it time to work. Uh, it's way out of your system before you jump to the antibiotics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hurley, you got 30 seconds of wisdom for us? No, I would agree with that. I think uh, we have to be very careful with antibiotics. We talked about uh, a lot of the acute bronchitis is with, are, uh, are self, uh, self limiting, and, but I think there's a population of folks that have chronic illnesses, a chronic bronchitis, uh, a chronic lung disease, uh, other situations where they need to call and maybe need antibiotic a little quicker than other folks if it's indicated. Okay. And Dr. Holm? Well, I, you know, I think overall lifestyle is a very important way to keep people well. And if you are exercising, can I say that again? Uh, you're going to be breathing deeply. You're going to be cleaning out your lungs. You're, you know, when you're mobile, you're able to protect yourself. I can emphasize a decent lifestyle, primarily that of being active, uh, and realize that we're, we're going to have to share. We want to go to church. So re realize that you, if you're shaking hands and touching people, don't put them in your face. Yeah. So uh, shake your hands, use the sterile stuff. That works very good for a respiratory, not very good for bowels uh, infections. And what a joy to have you here. Thank you both for joining us so much. Thank you, yep. yeah. Gentlemen, thanks. It's been a great discussion. Thanks for the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Stay tuned. We will be right back with the Homespun Perspective and then what's new in medical science. Looking for reliable healthcare information online? You can start with the resources link at the OnCall website. 
From there, you can access a variety of accurate and dependable information sources, including the South Dakota State Department of Health and Medline Plus. I get questions about colds and flu and the use of antibiotics to treat them all the time. A couple of weeks ago, I came down with a miserable cold. It started with a sore throat, fever, a plugged up nose, and a dry, hacky cough. Took a week of menthol cough drops, lots of hot liquids, and a smattering of Tylenol before the thing passed. It's important to know that colds are due to viruses, not bacteria. If a single bacterium was the size of a bear, then a virus would be the size of a rat. And while bacteria can live and grow outside of human cells, viruses grow only when inside the cells they infect. The Center for Disease Control puts it this way, snort, sniffle, sneeze, no antibiotic, please. And if you have a cold or flu, antibiotics won't work for you. These pithy slogans offer truth. Antibiotics don't help against virus infections. They can be expensive, cause allergic reactions, mess up the normal flora and natural resistance to infection, and most importantly, their use can result in resistant organisms that can come back and cause new infections that won't respond to antibiotics. So how do we know when antibiotics should be used? First, we know that when a patient shows a combination of sore throat, early fever, cough, and especially nasal congestion, it's 98% more likely to be viral, not bacterial, even if the secretions are green or yellow. Generally, the fever and sore throat last only two days, and the stuffiness and cough last about two weeks or more. That's virus. If the patient, on the other hand, has just a sore throat, no runny nose, or if their ears start to hurt, then it could mean a bacterial infection and an antibiotic may help. If an early fever resolves itself and then after a week or so the fever comes back with a worsening cough, again think bacteria. These are times when an antibiotic may be very important. Take home message, if you have a cold or flu, antibiotics won't work for you and they may even do you harm. But if the fever comes back with a worsening hack, get in to see your doctor. We'll be right back. Huh? A hack. In our medical news tonight, the South Dakota Diabetes Coalition is a partnership of individuals and groups within our state who share a mission of improving the health of people affected by diabetes. The coalition is now working to create free diabetes education toolkits for organizations that want to join in this mission. The toolkits are designed to go out to service organizations, public libraries, county extension agents, and similar entities. The toolkits will contain a DVD and take home materials with information designed to improve the health of individuals with diabetes and pre-diabetes. If you'd like to learn more about either the South Dakota Diabetes Coalition or their educational toolkits for organizations, you can do so by going to their website at doh.sd.gov slash diabetes slash coalition. Again, that's doh.sd.gov slash diabetes slash coalition. Or you can call the coalition coordinator at 605-336-3505. Again, that phone number is 605-336-3505. And in other news, you've heard about rehab, but have you heard about prehab? Un researchers at the University of Louisville studied prehabilitation. This was an exercise program designed for patients planning to undergo knee replacement surgery. The exercises consisted of light resistance training, flexibility and step exercises, and light walking. What the researchers found out is that prehab, done for 48 weeks prior to surgery, did make a difference, a positive difference, in patients' knee extension prior to surgery. That is, they went into surgery with a little more strength in the knee than those who underwent surgery without prehab. Now, the disappointing thing about this study, at least to me, is that it did not compare post-op recovery between those who had prehab and those who did not. However, scientists involved in the study think that the stronger the knee is going into surgery, the quicker the recovery will be coming out of surgery. 
And that's all the time we have for this week. Remember, On Call is rebroadcast on SDPB Digital Channel 2, Mondays at 11 a.m. Central and Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Central. And if we didn't get to your question on air, we might be able to get it posted on our website. Check out our web address. Thanks to our guests, Dr. Matt Bean, Dr. Brian Hurley, and our medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. Thanks to our phone volunteers, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. Have a good evening. Funding for this program is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. To learn more about life and health, you can order your copy of The Picture of Health, a beautiful book containing insightful essays and evocative images by on-call medical editor Dr. Rick Holm and Dr. Judith Peterson. This book, containing health care advice, stories of medical history, and meditations on healing, can now be yours for $17 at the South Dakota Ag Heritage Museum. Call 1-877-227-0015. 15 to order. This offer is made by Ag Bio Communications at South Dakota State University.